Hi everyone, today we are here uh, with Ace Busters, Johan from Ace Busters, who, want, who is one of the founders. We're going to learn about that uh, much more. Johan, how are you doing today? Hi Phil, I'm doing very good. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for, for doing this call. I am super excited. Um, I'm a poker player and a crypto nerd. Uh, so something like a poker solution on a blockchain is very, very exciting to me. And um, you guys are actually, uh, I, I've seen a few solutions that propose a poker solution on the blockchain. And most of them haven't actually um, convinced me that they're an actual solution. And you guys have actually proposed something where for the first time I'm like, hmm, this could be an actual solution to the, to the online poker problem. So I'm very excited to talk to you today. Um, and hear your thoughts and, and, and background. Absolutely. Cool. Happy to answer yeah. everything. All right. So um, why don't we start uh, from the beginning? So tell me, what is the mission or the whole uh, purpose behind your project? Um, yeah, we've set out because uh, I, uh, um, I have a, a co-founder who is a Pope. Uh, a poker, uh, poker player as well and uh, he kind of approached me um, when I was doing Ethereum smart contracts and he said like Johan wouldn't be able to do uh, wouldn't be able to make a poker game on the blockchain and I said no that's way too slow on the blockchain it's impossible and so on and he bugged me a couple few more times and we started developing on it and we really saw um, which problems uh, uh, blockchain could solve and uh, there's a other problems that online poker has that cryptography could solve mm -hmm. and I, I got more, more excited about it every day and uh, now it's already nine months uh, straight working on this project and uh, we got a working prototype and we are very excited about it to, sh to share it with everyone and uh, um, yeah I think the, the problems that we really that we really can solve is that we're not a that there is no counterparty really needed like online poker started with online casinos taking the money and doing the shuffling for the players and um, the first days it was great and then let, it led to all these uh, uh, scandals that happened Black Friday and so on just if you have that power to manage the money of someone then you can as well do something else with it like invest it in something do fractional reserve yeah. and that's where all the cost comes in for, for the regulated online casinos right so they need to make sure that they uh, don't do, do anything wrong with the cash. They have a good random number generator and so on. And we just want to take out this middleman. And I think we're on a we're on a very good way to there. Yeah, and I actually you talk about the demo. I actually played with you yesterday, and I was actually quite impressed because it was a working demo, right? So like we were actually playing some hands. It maybe wasn't quite as smooth as Poker Stars, but it's also um, you know just a prototype. So. Um, I was very impressed and I saw that there were actual Ethereum um, transaction going on. Um, so that was, that was very, very cool. Yeah, so that was on, on, on main chain Ethereum, right? So uh, the transactions that you've seen is probably um, getting out, uh, getting into the payment channel that we have channels where like two to 10 players can participate and getting out of it. And all in between is kind of happening in this. Um, it is ha happening where uh, players just exchange uh, signed receipts of how much they bet and um, either at the end they settle successfully and leave the table with the money they want. If they don't agree, then this technology has like a fallback mode, a dispute mode, and that's where you submit all the receipts, that uh, the highest receipts of every hand to the blockchain and it calculates the result by itself and then pays out the money. So essentially, you've created a payment channel, um, uh, l uh, like a, a Raiden type payment channel. Or what are you using there from a from a technology perspective? Did you build something uh, yourself? Are you using something that's already out there? We um, we started pretty much with the Raiden approach. So we are having a, a yellow paper coming out very soon, which we call the multi party state channel. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we basically took this idea of a payment channel, of a state, like the abstraction of a payment channel when it's not about money, it's called state channel, where you mm -hmm. can pretty much manage everything. And that's kind of what we, I mean, we still manage money, but we manage it between many players. 
So mm -hmm. yes, we extended that concept and uh, we have smart contracts which are able to handle that on the chain. Mm -hmm. And an implementation uh, uh, that does that between the browsers, so that keeps mm -hmm. the payment channel up and running between many participants. And that's the actual innovation when it comes to managing the money. That's what makes it affordable to kind of go onto the Ethereum main chain where every Every transaction that you send can easily cost like 30, 40 cents right now. Yeah. And basically you get away with playing many hands and just paying the transaction fee for getting in and getting out of the table. Yeah. And so yesterday I was playing with you um, with very, very little money. I, I remember I sent about $10, $15 worth of Ethereum to this, uh, to this account and um and bought the nuts which are the chips basically right um mm -hmm. and and i i didn't see how it cost me anything to get into the game so how did you like how did you deal with the fees did you guys just pay for me or what happened there or did i actually pay um so <laughs> so uh, right now we operate with a flat one percent uh rake um, mm -hmm. So you paid a little bit, uh, probably when you exited the table, then the rake went uh, mm -hmm. to a rake account that redistributes the whole thing to the shareholders. Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, we, we kind of have a two-tiered system. Uh, so when you start your account, you're a fish. You yes. have a fish account. So I'm and, a fish right uh, now, right? For the fish account. <laughs> Officially, yes. Okay, um, cool. So just... With the fish account, we basically make all this blockchain stuff invisible for you. So you just have your email and your password as you're used to on other sites, and then, then you can join tables, but your account limit is 0.1F, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that's what you use for playing, and then our backend pays your transaction cost. Yeah. And then what you can do is uh, you can unlock your account, where you basically mm -hmm. take control of that um, smart contract that represents your account. Mm -hmm. And link it, link it to your wallet that you have in your browser. You can use Mist or MetaMask or anything like mm -hmm. that that has an API. And once you're a fish, you have to pay your own transactions. So you would have a small pop-up before you join the table, uh, which tells you, hey, this requires a transaction. Please send some. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, um, and um, yeah, so that's it. So I saw that in the white paper and uh, I didn't, I hadn't read the white paper actually when I played with you. And then um, because I just learned about you yesterday from a, from a friend who writes this, the wealth of chips uh, blog. I don't oh. know if you're aware of it. Um, Absolutely. So he's, yeah. I read he, that a lot over the last couple of months. Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, he's a good, uh, he, he's a good buddy of mine. He's actually the first guy I was able to talk crypto with ever. Um, and so he has a lot of uh, ideas. And actually, I, I, I myself, I try to uh, uh, develop a poker, uh, a poker concept uh, com completely off chain. Um, and so mm -hmm. I've, uh, uh, I have some experience thinking about basically the, e the economics of, of poker. Anyway, yeah, so, um, so that was very cool. I was very impressed uh, that we could play. Um, I, of course, there, there's a couple of suggestions on the UI, but just the fact that you could play poker on the blockchain, I think it's very impressive. Um, and in this, uh, in this way, I haven't seen this. And I really like that before you do a crowd sale, you actually have a product and we can see that it works. I also really love the white paper. I read the white paper yesterday. I love that I could read it in, um, in a short amount of time and that it was structured very simply and that it was written also in a simple language so that you can really read it through and understand it and it's not written in a complicated way so you have to reread pages in order to understand them so to me i'm also a crypto investor this is really important to me that i can really quickly understand what's going on and have a good concept of what you guys are doing so i felt like within 20 minutes reading the white paper i had a good comprehensive overview of you of what you guys are doing and how you're doing it so that was cool. really cool thanks for the feedback cool. yeah so um um okay so i have uh um yeah i i, I have like a million questions um so the other thing I noticed in the white paper was that you guys have a roadmap 
and that mental poker is on the roadmap, right? So mm -hmm. how did you, in the uh, solution that you have out there today, how do you do the shuffling um, if you don't use mental poker? Exactly. So the shuffling is done in a very traditional way. We just uh, collect a couple of like hashes from uh -huh. uh, the player. Uh, so commitments, so to say, that becomes the random number, and from that mm -hmm. the cards are generated. So, but there is trust with our current backend. I don't want to, uh, how do you say, claim that we have a perfect, uh, how do you say, we don't have a mental poker implementation right now. Okay. We have spent quite some time on uh, on on working one out, mm -hmm. uh, but we understand that this is uh, serious, and we want to do it in a good way. So, what what we can present, kind of, if we turn the mental poker mode on right now is that all the players um, um, uh, take the encrypted deck and they shuffle it one after the other. Mm -hmm. And then if one of the players did a fair shuffle, then you know that the deck is kind of fair shuffled. The problem with that approach, with the private, the way they use the private keys is, is uh, dropout tolerance. So if one of the players would go offline during the game, then the game would not continue. It would be stuck. And this drop about tolerance is something that we think is essential um, to develop before we can take this uh, live, before we can put it mm -hmm. in the game. And that's, mm -hmm. that, that's uh, what we raise the money for. That's the most essential thing. Um, there is different ways to approach this, like threshold signatures and so on. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I mean, we have kind of the, the people in the team that are good with cryptography, that have a background in that. A lot of them worked on, uh, for example, the first multi-sig wallet in Bitcoin in another startup. And um, I think we kind of have the power to do that, but we need a bit of time. And uh, um, yeah, um, that's why we went this way. So first we want, we show that we can take one counterparty out, the banking counterparty. That's why we mm -hmm. put the whole thing on chain. And next we want to take the dealer counterparty out so that the players shuffle themselves but do it in a good way so there's dropout tolerance. Okay, so let me understand. So right now, do you have some sort of server that's between the players, um, and then but the players yeah. are still shuffling the deck, so you have kind of a half um, solution that has the drawback that if somebody uh, drops or loses connection, the game halts, and I totally agree with you, you won't be able to, um, to play smoothly because this is something that happens all the time, and I could just, like, if I lose a hand, I could just unplug my computer and that sort of stuff. So yeah, absolutely, cool. Exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. And then it also makes sense that right now your solution is, is a heads up solution. Um, there it's not so much a pro problem, I guess. Okay, cool. All right, so mental poker is basically on the roadmap. I saw this on the roadmap, but, but also the roadmap is not uh, not too far out. So so you think, how, how much time do you guys think you need to develop basically um, until you have an actual solution that you can offer a product? Um, yeah, so the, the roadmap uh, takes a couple, of two, a couple of features into account. I think we have these stretch goals, um, if you've seen them in the paper. So there was, I yeah. think, mental poker, there were side bets and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can execute pretty, um, pretty quickly on the mental poker. And then I don't want to be like... Uh, realistic or something like that but it, mm -hmm. it takes time if, to build up such operations from zero to hero of course yeah um, we had our we had our beta which we were running on the ethereum test net where we played mm -hmm. uh, 10,000 hands with uh, mm -hmm. first a uh, few hundred signups mm -hmm. and um, so we learned a little bit there but uh, as you see we still have crashes and the table still sometimes get stuck and so on so I think um, if we go uh, and um, cr close the crowd sale quickly, then we'll probably need like three months for the mental poker stuff, and then another three months to really uh, make sure that we have solid operations and uh, can run uh, six-player tables, ten-player tables, and eventually tournaments. Yeah, okay. Very cool. Um, so to me, there are... Uh there are two problems that you need to solve when you do uh, poker on the blockchain. Number one, you need to solve just the fact that you can play a game, right? So the, the pure like mm -hmm. playing on the blockchain is one thing that you got to solve. 
The other problem that you need to solve, and this is why poker is so much more difficult than a casino game, is that in poker you actually need to govern the game a little bit, right? So in poker there can be cheating, there can be bots, all that sort of stuff. So that to me is probably even a, um, a harder problem. And the thing is when you do it on the blockchain, um, but, or, or let, let, let me uh, start the other way. When you do this in a company, the company is doing all of this. So Poker Stars takes care of all of this. And basically, as a player, I'm trusting them that they're taking care of the game and making sure that there's no cheating going on. Just like when I go into a casino, right? I'm trusting them to run a fair game. And this is, for me personally, a reason why I don't play in home games. Um, so here in America, there's a lot of home games that are run illegally kind of by, by the mafia. I don't like to play in them. I prefer to go to my casino and play there. So mm -hmm. that part, the governance of the game, I think is a, is a really big problem. And most of the solutions that I've seen don't really have a solution to that. Um, or I haven't really any, seen anything uh, other than maybe... Uh, yeah, so I saw what, what, after reading the white paper, I saw for the first time that you had a solution by staking uh, staking these nuts um, and that sort of stuff. So let's talk a little bit. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about that. It looks to me like you guys learned a little bit from Steam. Is that correct? That I, I saw a lot of Steam-like concept in your solution. Is that correct, or did you just come up with your solution completely independent? No, no, no. Uh, I'm definitely a big Steam fan, and um, they Sweet, even use the too. same. Yeah, they use the same name for their token. Uh, I think they have a Steam power uh, yes. somewhere, even though they don't show it like that in their wallet. They only display Steam itself. Somehow. No, 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 no. That's um, that's not true. You def I definitely have lots of Steam power. I mean, I, I yeah, they, they more, say Steam I... power, and then but they measure it in steam they say you have yes. like 5000 steam of steam power or something like That's that right? yeah correct. but i really like the their concept and i think there is uh, something very valuable in there the fact that um, you have different interest groups in kind of your uh, audience when you make an app or like yes. you know when you make an, a net a crypto network so to say there's different audiences and you want to cater to their interests and um, a, an app token that is for investors can just never work because investors want volatility yes. and gains and so on and the users want stability. But uh, to come back to collusion and to governance of the game, uh, yeah, that's of course the biggest problem in online poker because um, um, there is all these problems like you can't identify people on the blockchain, the Sybil attack and so on. Actually, to go about these things, um, I've, um, I'm here in Berlin and I, I've been meeting the Ethereum team a lot and uh, they are, of course, all into uh, getting the proof of stake on the road. Um, and I've, I've dived into the proof of stake concept and make, made some presentations about it and they often mention crypto economic incentives to kind of yeah. keep this network alive. And um, so we have two approaches towards the collusion problem or towards the governance. One is very similar to what actually the, uh, the staking is in proof of stake in the way yes. that um, we have different, uh, we, we can't guard our casino like we don't, or our poker rooms, we don't have walls where you can stand at the door and look at people. Um, yeah. The virtual wall is kind of get, getting into the cryptocurrency, buying the nuts and having the power. And we can only check once if you try to enter the, the table, like what kind of guy are you, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing that we can do at the table is uh, we have tables that are open to everyone, but for some tables to join, you need to have a small amount of power. Mm -hmm. And the advantage, um, let me introduce power real quick. So you yes. can have nuts, which is the player's token, and, not, uh, and power, which is kind of the investor's or shareholder's token. It basically gives you a fixed percentage of the economy and you can do votes with it. Uh, but what you can't do is you can't transfer it. So you can only power up from nuts to power and power down again. Um, mm -hmm. And that power down, that is not immediate. So we hold that um, we pay out 10% 10 times over the period of three months. So you would need three months to power down your power completely. Yes. And that is, that is what we use when you come to the table. So 
and, um, and this the idea is, is and, to... and, and by the way, oh. hey, hold, hold on. And so, so this is exactly what looks to me like Steam. In Steam, I can also power up, and then it takes three months to power down, and then I can basically get my Steam back. And it, when it's powered up, I can't trade it. And so you said uh, three months and ten months. So um, c can you explain again the difference yes. of the, how the power down? No, works? Uh, no it, it, the power down is um, ten payouts mm -hmm. over three months. So okay. every nine days, you can kind of get ten percent of it. That's right. that's okay. all. Okay. Um, so similar, like and mm -hmm. exactly. So what we uh, what what we want to do is in, in these tables that have a little bit higher probability that require power to to join. Um, um, we have a voluntary like self-reporting. So ten minutes after the game finished, you can publish your cards, and there will be a statistical analysis kind of executed on those mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that there was nothing wrong and if we can prove with like analyzing the cards that there was something wrong mm -hmm. uh, we propose to slash power to that player so which means mm -hmm. uh, we can penalize someone for doing certain things um, and um, the intention here is of course to guard or how do you say like to create a disincentive for people to behave in, certain, to behave in a wrong way at the poker table yeah, that, that is, is very that, that so is this, very crucial. Yeah. So these slashing conditions, exactly like a proof of thing, um, mm -hmm. is exactly is one aspect of how we want to guard the game. Uh, the other aspect is um, we don't want to identify our players. I think we want to like we want to stay true to kind of the crypto idea of, of uh, mm -hmm. you have an address, you have a private key, and that's what you are. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so we can't identify them. We can't say this address is one person or two people or three people or something like that. But what we can do is we can create uh, we can create reputation still. So what, when you sign up with our platform, you get your own personal uh, smart contract, which is like your identity contract. I don't know if you heard of uh, this product that Consensus has. It's called Uport. Yes. Uh, um, basically, they do something very similar, right? Uh, unfortunately, they are not on main chain, so we had to uh, go ahead there again and build our own. Uh, but we deploy an identity contract for you, and only you can control that. And um, even if you like recover your wallet and change your private key or anything like that, that address always stays the same. Mm -hmm. And that gives us the opportunity, or it gives the we can give players the ability uh, to at, uh, do attestations to each other, to kind of mm -hmm. collect reputation. So then when you go to tables, you can actually see what, what kind of attestations this, these players at the table have received before okay. and can kind of make your own choice a little bit like on eBay if you want to play with them or not. Okay, so got, I got a question about that. So, so you said that after a game, a player can basically publish their cards. So is this something that is voluntary mm -hmm. and not every player may do that? Or is it... Or uh, is it like we are going to have data about every player and every hand played? Um, we definitely don't want to publish this on the blockchain or something like that. So mm -hmm. right now we are. This is a. This will be a private service, and out of this private service uh, that you can participate in or not. So mm -hmm. if there is no uh, complaint about the game, then you don't need to publish your cards. But uh, ideally, if you publish a lot of your cards and there is no statistical like deviation like you always fold your kings or something like that um, then um, um, if we have that data then we can make assumptions about things and we can basically prove that your power shouldn't be slashed so that you that you're, you're a good actor in this game and um, we don't have a, a concept how to decentralize that yet um, yes. Um, for, for example, some poker platforms propose like a peer-to-peer -peer system where everyone validates someone else. I think we really want to focus on making things work first of all, and taking the banking counterparty out by putting this on the blockchain is already a way of decentralization. But not everything has to be decentralized from day one because then it just won't work. I think. So yeah. um, and and this validation service is something that we that we think to do centralized first and kind of make slashing conditions. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And if we then can uh, decentralize that slowly by, you know, having different parties doing this for different tables, you know, you would set up your own table, you would have um, a statistical validation on the cards, you could decide your own rake and so on. So it's, it's going into that direction. Yeah, so this is and this is why uh, po- poker is probably one of the more complex, uh, complicated solution to build, because um, yeah, th- th- there are not very straightforward solution, and there is uh, whichever decision you take. Like for instance, you could just publish all the cards on the blockchain somewhere, but then uh, people can be analyzed very easily. You can find out how much money people are losing, and obviously this is not something that um, people will like and they will then probably not play on your site. Um, On the other hand, when you have to use these these private services, right, you get back to um, uh, to these issues that you have when you uh, when you do online poker in companies. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So so but but uh, the path that you have kind of chosen seems to be making a lot of sense. if you have a private service, especially if you can have several services, so maybe you have a third party provider that offers the service and we can trust them that they will keep our data and then we can share all of our data. But basically also, if I'm a player and I don't want to share ever any of my data, I can choose so, but I will probably get a bad reputation and not be able to play in the very profitable games. Is that correct? Um, yeah, you would probably not be able to join all the tables. So uh, we want to make this basically de- decided by the players, of course, mm-hmm. like what kind of tables there should be. And uh, uh, the whole, how do you say, architecture of the system with this power where you, you can do votes and so on is laid out for that so that the community makes the decisions. Um, but yes, you wouldn't be able to join some of the tables that require you to have a certain track r- record. Uh, you could, of course, maybe convince with other attributes that you got a lot of good attestations from other players um, for a long period of time, like over a couple of months. And then you would probably have a rating that would still allow you to join. So you, you just imagine yeah. a star system where half yeah. of it is about how many cards, how many yeah. of your cards you published, and half of it about how much attestations you have. What about, um, do we know when play, players win and lose? Is that publicly available? Because if you have a player that just constantly loses, you don't really need all this. You don't need to basically in, inquire about it. Basically, any time you have these cheating things that you need to deal with, it's only about the winning players, right? So as long as somebody comes on the side and loses money, just like you can play any way you want type of thing this is how I would handle it. But then if you win, this is when you would have to prove that you are like not cheating, that you're not using bots, that you're not using software that you're not supposed to do and that sort of stuff, right? Because one of the big issues uh, now that is happening in poker is that these um, neural networks that produce produce GTO type of bots are coming out. And so one fear that I would have playing online poker today is I don't want to be sitting with like, you know, uh, eight uh, GTO bots on a, on a poker table. Yeah, they're all bots and they all collude. That would be great, right? Um, yeah, yeah th- that's that's indeed a problem. Um, so uh, like the old bots, they're very easy to recognize because the, sometimes they just don't have statistical deviation and they're be- behavior or something like that so um but the new ai bots uh, they're so similar i mean there there is not many that run effectively where, where you don't need a whole server uh, farm yeah. to kind of operate them right but i imagine that if this trend continues then they will be very hard to distinguish from humans yeah and um you're, you're right um you only need to look at the winning players probably to see if there is anything going wrong and uh, but and the great thing is, or how do you say, like the good thing is that everyone can choose whom they play with, right? And the more information you have about uh, the history of someone, um, not what what their um, uh, win rate, I mean, you would find the win rate as well. But um, the more information you have, the better you can kind of decide, is this something for me? Should I play at this table or this community or not? Um, Just to get back to the nature of blockchain and uh, payment channels and so on, we are not anonymous and our payments on Ethereum are not yet anonymous, they're all 
pseudonymous. I don't know how to uh-huh. pronounce that correctly. So yeah, everyone is, yeah. <laughs> so everyone is ident is identified by their address, and mm-hmm. because uh, and that also means that you can just go back in the blockchain and dig up all your transactions that that happened uh, at poker tables. Uh-huh. And see how how much you're winning or losing, and that is just okay. the nature of like at least at least Ethereum right now. So you would totally yeah. be able to and, see and that. Again, I, and I again, actually... not. Yeah, so I think that's. Uh, I mean, that is unfortunate on the one hand because people can just look up how much of a fish you are, um, mm-hmm. and then again you have. But on the other hand, it's also important to have that information for these. Uh, for the purpose of analysis, right? Um, so yeah, so th- these are very, very interesting, uh, you know, decisions and design decisions you guys are going to have to make to come up with something that is compete competitive against Poker Stars um, in 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 all it, in in you know all its glory that these these solutions have. And so I see a lot of. Uh, projects that are just basically saying hey we have a poker app on the blockchain but for a poker player that is not going to be a reason to switch over right? because i can already on many um, on many sites i can just use bitcoin on ethereum to deposit my money so like um we also need on the pr- product feature and on the economics of the game we need to be able to compete with them to actually be competitive i think so I'm very happy that you guys have looked at this and that you have these uh, economic incentives to basically make the game work. So I think that's um, um, that's very good. The, the powering up and uh, slashing conditions this is something I had never thought of in the context of poker. But once I read your white paper, it made perfect sense. Um, cool. The one, the, the one thing um, in, in terms of could this be a problem I was thinking about yesterday <clears throat> is so if I want to play in a profitable game and a profitable game just means that the, the amount of money that's lost relative to the rake, I assume, mm-hmm. it's generated, right? Yeah. So um, a lot of players misunderstand what, like, uh, what actually makes for a profitable game in poker. In, in the end, it's just the rake that makes for a profitable game because if, you know, uh, in the game, a million dollar is lost and a million dollar is raked, then on average nobody can win and you know if half the money is raked it's still not a very profitable game and i personally actually think that at poker stars the effective rake is probably like 80 percent um so when i did some analysis that's kind of what i came up with um okay so if you want to play in 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 the profitable games you need to have these these power this this power right so um, one of the things I was thinking about is if I wanted to collude, I could just create like five accounts, power up, and uh, and then play with these five accounts. Uh, but then I guess because of the fact I now have five times as much money at stake that can be slashed, the crypto incentives are going to prevent me from doing that. Is that basically the idea? Yes, that is uh, that is basically the idea. Yeah, so that um, um, value is bound for a certain period of time for this three months, and we have time to go back and uh, make an analysis and mm-hmm. um, then make a decision based on that. Um, um, so you, you, you started this um, effective rake discussion, which I think is very interesting. Um, yeah. on, I also read a lot about that on the wealth of chips and I'm not sure if I've seen your analysis, but I've seen some about poker stars and others yeah. and what the effective rake is. And that's exactly, I think, one of the uh, uh, advantages where we can, where we don't need to kind of milk the players and um, uh, take everything away that most of the uh, slightly winning players would win. Uh, but we can just have a low rake structure and, and go with that. Um, yeah. mostly because there is not this overhead that online um, platforms have that need to do KYC and AML and audit um, their infrastructure yeah. and so on, but it's kind of audited by the community and open source and all out there. Um, so yeah, we can. I think we can offer much better uh, like profitability to, to everyone. And then still, um, the traditional platforms have a network effect, right? So... Oh, yes. Um, there, are, there is just a lot of people playing on PokerStars, and that's why professional play, players are there as well. 
because they have a lot of uh, um, how do you say it? they that's where they can get their money if they come to to our uh, platform and there's five players uh, it's probably not going to do it for them it's like starting to trade on an order book that is empty yeah, liquidity, uh, liquidity you just so, need a, yeah yeah, yeah so, and we so, talk about so, our, this liquidity thing in the paper a lot i guess uh, yeah, li li liquidity is huge things. i can also tell you again i'm a poker player i'm um i play a couple times a week um 10 to 20 hours a week is what I play poker and liquidity is a huge issue also in even in live casinos so for instance I live in Philadelphia there's three casinos here I can only play a two and uh, um, the only casino that always has my game is actually one casino so liquidity is a big issue and you can see this in markets for instance in Atlantic City this is like the, a little type Vegas town um, here on the East Coast and you can see how one casino that starts to be successful then sucks up the entire market. And this is because uh, if you play a very low stake game, so for instance, in a live casino, if you play a hundred dollar game, a one two game, you'll be able to find a game anywhere. But the next game up already, a two five game, um, there's mm -hmm. there's you already have a liquidity problem, right? Like you can't go at like noon and play two five at my casino. So like uh, people that like to play um, during the day, uh, they basically have to change their schedule already. So liquidity is a huge thing. And so in online poker, um, uh, this effect is even bigger because uh, very quickly you get to a state where you unless you play a very cheap game, for instance, if you play tournaments online, right, you you can always find like a one to ten dollar tournaments everywhere on every site, even if it's a very small site. But as soon as you want to play a fifty dollar tournament, basically you need something like like poker stars. You already like on party poker, you can't find a game um, like that. So a liquidity is is a very big issue, and because everybody can always play where all the liquidity is happening. Um, everybody just just goes there because of that. Uh, so yeah, so this is something that from a marketing perspective uh, is, is, is very important to handle. And I think also when you want to create a profitable game, what you can actually do is uh, take some of this rake back and use it to create liquidity. So I think um, if you create this uh, profitability as your goal, uh, you actually can just take some of the rake that you get and use it uh, uh, for marketing purposes. So if you think about how Poker Starts does it, they rake 80% of the of the of the game away, and then they give it to uh, pretty people that they put patches on. They give it to soccer players in Brazil. Um, they do all of this stuff that costs them like. Uh, is super much money we know from like uh, when black friday happened you know how much money full tilt poker was burning and giving to their pros so um they were basically using a lot of the, this money for marketing purposes and i think there are a lot of models where you can uh, use the marketing to create liquidity i.e give it to fish um, like people that are losing uh, that then will use it to play on your site and then you can basically have an intrinsic uh, marketing cycle that creates liquidity and is much more competitive to markets like poker stars because everybody on poker stars loses so if you really think about it 90 percent of poker players online poker players lose we know that fairly certain right so 90 percent of your customers mm -hmm. have a negative experience so if you had create like more winning players on your side immediately going to have an advantage in customer retention or player retention. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very interested in uh, in modeling the rake and creating this kind of thing. It's exactly my... I'm not a poker pro, unfortunately, so uh, I, I can't go too deep into that, but like this is definitely one of my hobbies and like designing the economy for Ace Busters and so on has uh, taken... What? Uh, well, a lot of this into account and we just yeah yeah so you don't play poker for fun so every time you do something for fun you have to pay for it right yeah this exactly. is the advantage of being a poker so what i love about poker is i can i can play poker and i enjoy the game and i make money it's like the best things in the, the best thing in the world but uh, yeah no i was just kidding so uh, as a as a 
developer, I can I can uh, talk to that from the other side. So I yes. always imagined um, a job where I can write software and in between always play games and then write software again. And that's pretty much what we are doing now. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to, I, uh, I, 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 I would, I would love to work with you guys, um, uh, on, on that stuff. Um, I had no idea you guys were, you guys were out there. Otherwise I would have reached out to you uh, way before already. All right. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, so, so that was kind of the other question. Uh, you, you talk about uh, profitability, but uh, how do you actually want to attain a higher profitability and how are you going to do that um, in conjunction with the power type of thing? So how's that, how, how do you envision that to work? Um, right, so um, we have... Uh, uh, we have two things uh, designed here the power thing where you basically hold a share of the economy right and mm -hmm. uh, we have this affiliate system so where we mm -hmm. kind of uh, keep track of who uh, who got whom onto the platform and which which uh, identity contract was initiated by some other identity mm -hmm. contract and um, these two things we want to use to kind of uh, um, design the rakeback system and unfortunately like I can't give you a finished design and we're mm -hmm. still pretty much on it and we would really love your input on that as well but the mm -hmm. idea is to kind of um, uh, split whatever in rake comes in so either mm -hmm. have, have a, um, a full rakeback um, that is going uh, half into the affiliate program and how it half into the uh, into the power so like mm -hmm. dividends to investors Mm -hmm. Or even have a negative rake, as you said, like uh, giving things back to players, and um, uh, designing it that way. So uh, ju uh, just uh, looking at the effective rake as like the um, uh, how do you say, like the main factor, and trying to design to design in that way. So I think it's interesting that we can combine like a, a cryptocurrency, like a, its own, an own currency, with this economy. And it pretty much comes down to the fact that uh, if the economy is growing mm -hmm. uh, and new players are joining and new deposits are made, um, we, we can we can measure that. So we can see it. Uh, we can look at certain factors of the economy and based on that, change for example, uh, a rake a, a rake back flows increase certain parameters and uh, just fuel the economy a little bit more. And yeah. um, I hope that from this like intersection of like an economic model and mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the games and the rakeback system, we can make something that, that leads to a very high effective, uh, very low effective rate. Yeah, yeah. And I think actually um, there has been models uh, where the rake was zero and they don't work. And the problem why they don't work is you do need uh, marketing and you do need operational mm -hmm. um, funds, right? So uh, if you really think about po poker stars, like you, you put a hundred bucks onto the side, poker stars get in the end gets 80 or 90 of it. Um, that's a lot of fuel that they can use to basically market their site, right? And so that's this right. is just yeah. going to attract a lot of um, a, a, a lot of players and if you think about why is apple successful right one of the reasons why a apple is successful is if you buy a phone half of the money that you give to apple is profits and that just creates a very healthy company that then is able to you know invest and do whatever they need to do to keep growing growing and growing and so i think these like just trying to reduce the rake as low as possible is not a good model i think what you need to come up with is a more balanced ratio between um you know the uh, the, the rake and and the winnings again i think anything about 50 percent is is just killing your you is just killing yourself i think something like 20 to 30 is probably a healthy kind of effective rake this is also what we pay in other industries if you think about uh, a, a tax system right in the united states taxes is about 25 30 percent of gdp mm -hmm. um in a in germany mm -hmm. it's a lot it's a lot higher right um 
And so, so something in that regard and then using that 20 to 30 percent in a way that mostly is beneficial and, and growth the economy or the ecosystem, then it's actually fine for people to pay for that. So I think that is something um, that in the design, like you talk about, is, is really critical to think about how, how to come up with an economic model that is just automatically growing i call this like the black hole marketing right type of type of approach that, yeah where, where it's built into the economic system that right. the marketing it, works it, it right basically it's yeah. like a snowball where it keeps growing yeah so i exactly actually so yeah i actually, I, I, oh, I, go, actually go ahead. Have, I actually have developed such a model and i'm, I'm happy to kind of uh, share some of it with you um but maybe not on this call the other question um I wanted to talk to you about are the nuts. Uh, in, in, in poker, yeah. we like to talk about the nuts. We always want to have nuts. So I love that name. Um, I, um, I don't like the fish name for these beginning players. So it's not a good idea to call fish fish. Like you should call them something prettier or nicer or something like that. Um, yeah. But the nuts is yeah, absolutely yeah. The, the nuts is absolutely amazing. Um, as a name. Now, one of the things that I saw is that I buy nuts through a smart contract. I give Ethereum into the smart contracts and just like mm -hmm. I would get chips on a cage, they give me a corresponding pegged currency to, uh, to the money that I'm using. Um, but then I also saw that the price may change. So you can basically decide what that price is. Why did you do that? Why didn't you just create a very pegged type of system? Why did you create a system where the price may change? So that was something that I was very curious about. Yeah, um, um, good questions. Uh, a lot of them in one in one uh, okay. sentence. So let's go. Um, uh, at the begin right now, uh, the price mm -hmm. is uh, yeah. We have an initial price that was uh, set. Uh, uh, for the crowd sale and um, the price is distinguished in two parameters the floor and the ceiling right so yeah. uh, you buy at the ceiling you sell at the floor and if it's set up without any spread then you can get in and get out anytime and you have a, a full we always maintain a full reserve at the floor price so that's yeah. that's baked in into the smart contract and no one can change that uh, the floor and the ceiling price can be changed by what we call the escrow council so this is right now like a, you know, a multi-signature uh, between uh, four individuals, so two from inside of Ace Busters and two from outside. And the idea is um, that um, basically after the crowd sale, we want to register nuts um, on secondary markets, right, so that they can be traded and that they may be improved in price. Uh, but for if we would maintain no spread and would have a fixed price, then they wouldn't be able to trade because we would always be like buyer and seller of last resort. So mm -hmm. we want to open up that spread a little bit so that the market can find a price between the floor and the ceiling price uh, mm -hmm. so that we can kind of have a sustainable slow growth. But what we don't want is like these cryptocurrency speculators to come in and execute like pump and dump schemes which would make your wallet today worth $100, tomorrow 10 and then 200 yeah. again, which would just be very unhealthy for the players, I think. Yeah. So that's why um, that's why we we can uh, it can be changed by this escrow council. So mm -hmm. the escrow council can right now it we just operate the way that three or four guys decide. Uh, mm -hmm. But the intention is that uh, with your power you can do votes. So the uh, Astro Council proposes votes, for example, like a monetary policy for the platform, like how quick, how quickly should we adjust to market changes? Like, mm -hmm. should we go up 10% every month or 20? And then the power holders vote on that back, and then that is implemented by uh, the escrow council. Yeah, the, and, issue that yeah I, this is the, kind issue, the issue that I see with this is if I'm ahead. a power holder, right, um, and mm -hmm. we have this smart contract, that sells basically a peg currency. This peg currency is also what my power is, right? So then what I would want is for that price to go up every day. So I yeah. would always vote for the price to go up because that makes me richer, right? 
Um, you you could so, vote for the ceiling to go to go very high, right? But you can't really affect the market price. But you would say you would take any gains that the market would bring. You would you would uh, not try to. Right. Um, but but, uh, but I could say well let let let's 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 uh, increase the 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 price that the that the market is going to demand for the nuts, right? So then because you won't be able to buy them cheaper anymore. Um, the, the price should kind of go up. So, yeah, so I, I, I also see that there could be uh, that this could create issues also to the fact that um, when you uh, that you then your reserves are lower all of a sudden, right? Like if you if uh, if you send like um, if you send like a hundred nuts or a thousand nuts for 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 one Ethereum and then later um, y um you only get 500 you the, the the amount of coins in circulation and the ethereum in the smart contract is not matching anymore so yeah so again i i was kind of i i i didn't quite understand the purpose uh why can't the nuts contract just work like a cage in a casino where there's certain amount of chips, certain amount of money, and there's always a one-to-one -one ratio between the two. Um, that's a good question. So I, I guess because um, um, if you just uh, look at it in terms of accounting, you can kind of account for the size of the economy by just how many, how much ether you have in the reserve, and then yeah. um, have the players play with that and then go out and take the rake as a profit and uh, that's it right uh, but yeah. if you kind of want to have a forward-looking model where you also where the price of the token also depends on speculation and what the expectation about the platform is and there is you know there's a the tomorrow's price kind of uh, today priced in already then that that could be another profit um, a profit point or that could be a way how the platform uh, uh, this community kind of, um, for example, pays for development or something like that. And I think by just having a floor and a ceiling uh, kind of price, we try to get both like, a, um, how do you say, like a compromise between the two systems where on the one side you can be sure that there is a reserve mm -hmm. and um, you always get something for your chips. And on the other side, we make it a little bit tradable and uh, can, can, for example, um, if uh, we know there is um, a pump coming up, let's just call it like that, um, we don't raise the ceiling price and don't absorb the pump completely, like in the way that the token price would go up 100%, but we keep the ceiling where it is and then the token price would only hit it and then there would be arbitrage between the markets and our contract which would actually lead to the fact that ether is flowing into our reserve and yeah. when there is a surplus of ether in the reserve and then the escrow council can go ahead and can say okay l let's use this uh, for something let's develop a new feature or let's use this for price money in tournaments and so on. So we, we're hoping that we get we designed a, a flexible system where we kind of can um, play with the price of the token and profit from that. Not only kind of be dependent on the rake. That's the idea. Okay. All right. Um, still something I have to think about. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it sounds very interesting. The, the other thing I was going to ask you guys is you've done a lot of work already, right? Like you have a kind of a pretty decent product. You've built um, all the stuff. How did you pay for this so far? And so is there a company behind all of this? Um, yeah, how is that sort of structure? And in the future, how are you going to uh, pay for development? How, how is that sort of model uh, going, to, going to work? Thanks for the compliment, first of all, that you see the work in there, because I'm, I'm most, mostly we just hear complaints, but it's cool. Um, yes, so um, we're basically just all uh, interested in that, and um, a couple of the guys from the team, but not everyone, um, we really want to, like, um, we really manage the shares and everything in this D app in power, and everyone is in there. Um, but um, a couple of guys came together the beginning and we created an Estonian entity um, okay. which um, which is like a software development company uh, that's mm -hmm. the a point it's not a point of like running 
a service like a, a gambling service or something and it's just a software development company and uh, we pooled some money so this is all bootstrapped so far from um, it's just our like um, Say, like you, our vanity did, did project. You, um, did you have outside investors, yeah. or is it the the, the 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 folks on the team that put up money? It's on, it's only the people on the team right now. So it's only us. Wow. We created that company, and uh, yeah, we paid for development so far, and now we're kind of at the point where if we want to go on at that rate, <laughs> we better raise the money. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and. Um, right, so this Estonian company is always supposed to stay a software development company. So if we um, raise money uh, in the crowd sale, then the um, escrow council will allocate a specific uh, part to a milestone and then pay it to the Estonian company to do the software development. And then the Estonian company can claim uh, the milestone and uh, take the next one and so on. That's the idea. So, so, so pretty much me, like a service. Yeah, so let me understand this correctly. So we have this DAP that is going to collect money for the crowd sale. The money in mm -hmm. that DAP will be distributed um, by this council and then given to an outside entity such as your Estonian entity to build stuff. Exactly. Yeah, there could be others if they sign up to complete one of our milestones. Uh, but so far we have our own uh, software development company that would take care of that. Yeah, and I be, and and all of this is controlled to through the power, right? Because the power yeah, will this is all through voting. Get the this oh. voting who gets to be on the council and that sort of stuff. Okay. Exactly. All right. So I think that was a good amount of overview for maybe a first interview. So um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I think we've spent uh, you know I don't know maybe fifty minutes or something. So that's a good kind of. Uh, overview uh thank you so much i'm very excited about this project and um maybe also look forward about uh, to to talk with you about kind of uh, the economics and and the models to make this thing work and be able to kill uh, poker stars because all the poker players cool have phil thanks thanks for having <laughs> yeah thanks for having me it was a big pleasure to talk that much actually quite a long time over the pro uh, about the project and i'm totally interested in this um, economic modeling that you were uh, referencing okay. and uh, love to talk. All right. Well, take care. Have a good day. Bye.